Well, good morning, everyone, and Merry Christmas to you all. For those of you who don't know, my name is Gary Buck. I'm the lead pastor here at Hopewell. And it's so great, again, to see all the kids in here and uh, to really truly be together as a family. And I think back to this past year, 2019, our theme was growing as a family, and we really are. And I'm so thankful for all of you, all my brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, I'm going to ask this question to all the kids here first. How many of you kids ever have a hard time falling asleep at night? Any, Any of you kids have a hard time falling asleep at night? Yes, I see that hand. And now, and let me ask the parents. How many parents ever have a hard time falling asleep at night? And let's be honest, okay? I think a lot of times we're all in the same boat. Now, well, for, uh, for many years, I, my kids right now are ages about 8 to up to 16. And so over the years, and if, you've, if you had any children yourself, uh, maybe you remember this, that maybe there were times in your life where your children couldn't fall asleep. And so what did you do? What, what strategies did you take? And I remember so many times, you know, reading bedtime stories to my kids. Um, I, I remember just maybe sometimes uh, singing a lullaby, rocking them to sleep at just crazy hours of the night. And I did this because I love them so much, of course. And, uh, and, and I remember one of my kids, um, I, I remember he, he had just had a hard time falling asleep at nights, and I would actually, he wanted me to hold his hand. And so I would hold his hand as he was falling asleep, and a lot of times I would just lay down next to his bed or his crib, and just, and I would fall asleep, and I'd wake up at 3 a.m., and, and my back's hurting, and, I'd, and I'm like still holding his hand, you know, and then, then I'd go back into bed, and, you know, the things we do for our children. And uh, another one of my kids uh, would often just say, hey, can you just stay in the room? Just stay in the room while I fall asleep, you know, even for five minutes. And, uh, and so, and I would do this. Um, and I was communicating something to my children, and I wasn't just communicating with the sound of my voice. What was I communicating to them? It was all about my presence, my proximity. This message of my presence, what I was really communicating was peace. They felt safe because I represented someone that they trusted who was stronger than their fears. That's what I represented to them. Whatever they were afraid of, if I was there in the room with them, I represented something stronger than what they were afraid of. And so, ever since sin entered the world, humanity, in a sense, has had a hard time falling asleep. We've had a hard time finding true and lasting peace. And, you know, the series that we're in right now is called Centerpiece. And we've been looking about all the ways that Jesus was the answer to our peace, to our struggles from our past and our future. He is the answer. And so Christmas was the answer to our insomnia. Jesus Christ is called Emmanuel. What's Emmanuel mean? God with us. And you know, we hear that over and over again, but if you really think about it, God with us, that's crazy, right? I mean, really, God is with us. He didn't have to be. And so the presence of God on earth means that there is someone we can trust who is greater than our fears. The word of God The message of the manger to the cross, in a sense, is our bedtime story. Now let's read a little bit from Luke 2 for our bedtime story. Luke 2, starting in verse 8. It says, In that same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then the angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the city of David, a Savior was born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly hosts with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favors. Did you notice what happens here? First, there's one angel. There's one angel, and he comes and he basically says, hey, I've got good news for you, and that good news is going to bring joy. And then what happens is either the the, the Bible or the the author uses a, a very important narrative word, which is the word suddenly. Suddenly, there's this multitude of angels. I think sometimes we forget that it went from one to a multitude, 
Just think about that. In other words, this is kind of like if musical terms, this is the crescendo. This is like, let me get your attention with the verse. And now here's the chorus. Here's the chorus of the main thing I want to say to you. And so what's the, what's the main message of, of what the multitude says? There's two parts. First, they give glory to God. Here's what's interesting about this, is that when they give glory to God, uh, the word glory in the Bible is often, it, it's, it's a word that has weight to it. In other words, when, when, you, when God gets glory, it's, or the word glory, it means that there's weight to it and something else is pushed aside in comparison because there's weight to this word. Um, it's kind of like this. Um, how many of you kids in here like ice cream? Anybody? All hands should be up, okay? All hands should be up. I love ice cream. And I remember as a kid, I went to the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, and they had that, like, frozen dried ice ice cream that the astronauts eat. I thought, this is amazing. I can have ice cream now wherever I go. So, any of you tried that ice cream, that fry, fr frozen dry ice ice cream? Is it good? If someone told me, like, this is the only ice cream that you would ever eat, I would be like, well, I will pass. Because it was such a disappointment. Now, if you compare that frozen dry ice ice cream to, like, Lancaster County homegrown ice cream that's, like, 90% fat and 90% sugar, <laughs> and that's why it's a miracle, because the math doesn't work out, right? <laughs> it's amazing stuff. And I don't care how I could have eaten that shady maple, and then someone, and I'm stuffed, and so, someone could say, do you want some ice cream? I'm like, yes, please, there's always room for ice cream, right? It is a miracle. And so this is really what the glory of God is with. This is what the angels are communicating to us, is that no matter what you have in your life, whenever, what, no matter what you think is glorious, it pales in comparison to the weight of the glory of God. And that's what they're communicating here. Everything else in your life that's glorious is frozen, dried ice, NASA ice cream compared to Lancaster County ice cream. That's what the angels are communicating here, the glory of God. It dwarfs all other glories. And then the second thing they proclaim is peace on earth. Peace on earth. And so in, in, in the Greek, the word for peace there is actually, this one means simply to rest. The angels aren't saying yet that there will never be another war on earth or that there's no more conflict. What are they talking about? What kind of peace are they talking about? The angels are talking about here about the kind of peace that means that you and me, we can stop striving and trying hard enough to save ourselves. That's the peace they're talking about. That's the good news they're talking about, that salvation has come and it will bring you rest. It's the end of trying hard enough or trying to be good enough. See, when we sin, we separate ourselves from God. And the only way that a perfect God could be with us is to somehow make us perfect or to put his perfection on us. But we can't do that about ourselves. And so the message of grace is, in many ways, what sets Christianity apart from all the other religions. All the other religions tell us what we have to do in order to find peace and joy and truth. And that is when we become afraid. In other words, when we try to find peace, when we're trying to search for Indiana Jones style, where it's like, where is this peace? Where is this truth? i got to find it. That's scary. And so Christianity makes it much, much easier. For instance, with other religions, like, for instance, with Islam, if a, if a Muslim person, uh, you were talking with a Muslim person, and you said, um, are you sure that you're saved, or that are you sure that you're going to be going to heaven? Um, they would never say, that they are sure because in, in, in the religion of Islam, the only way, only God knows, and the only way that uh, you're going to be saved is if you did enough good, and there is a scale that they believe in, and so it's like if your good outweighs the bad, then, you, then you're going to go to their version of heaven. And so, but, but you would never, ever, ever claim that you know if you were good enough because you don't know how Allah's scale works. And so that's, that's a terrifying way to live. To not have that assurance or to not have that peace. See, Jesus did not come to make recommendations about how to find life and peace. What did Jesus say? He, said, he didn't say, I've got a manual for you here and here's your to-do list of what you have to do. No, he said, he didn't, say, he didn't have recommendations to have, find life and peace. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
I am those things. It's right, it's all found in me. Now, have you ever thought about the power of a lullaby? How many of you ever remember a lullaby being sung over, over you? I don't care how old you are. How many of you remember a lullaby being sung over you sometime in your life? Now, many of us probably don't remember them because we were probably one or two years old. So maybe the kids here remember it. Maybe you just had one sung over you. But lullabies are powerful. But really, Christmas is a lullaby of peace. But strangely, if you think about the lullabies in the, in the history of the world, uh, as I studied them, I found that most of them are actually pretty terrifying and very much fear-based. For instance, I, I want to read a few of them to you here. This is the most popular Haitian lullaby. It's just a couple lines here. It says, night, night, little mama, if you don't sleep, the crab will eat you. <laughs> In Russia, here's a popular lullaby, sleep, 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 don't lie too close to the edge of the bed, or little gray wolf will come and grab you by the flank and drag you into the woods. So that would certainly put you at ease. Uh, the, the Indonesian island of Java. Please hush, don't keep on crying, my child with a lovely face. If you cry, you won't look as beautiful. Please hush, my child, there. The moon is full, like the head of a scary giant, one who's looking for a crying child. <laughs> and this really, church, this is exactly what kind of lullaby the world tries to sell us. That if you don't stop crying, if you don't stop making mistakes, there's a God who's going to come and punish you. And he's going to be looking for a crying child. If you don't start acting good enough, if you don't start piling up your list of good deeds, and you're going to be on the what list? The naughty list. This is what the world communicates to us. And it, this is the kind of lullabies they sing. So what, what does it do to a child, or to any of us, when the message that's supposed to bring security is actually bathed in fear? What does it do to us when our view of God is that he's just ready to pounce and to punish us? Consider the lyrics of our most famous lullaby. Rockabye baby on the treetop. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. And when the bow breaks, the cradle will fall. And down will come baby, cradle and all. Isn't that just a peaceful message? <laughs> now, see, if you just read the words, does it sound good? No. But why do we sing this over our kids? Because it's the melody, right? Rockabye baby. It sounds nice, right? This is how the world deceives us. It bathes this message of fear and religion and do good around a melody that sounds pleasant and kind of makes sense. That if you do this, 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 and this, you, now you're good, you can go to heaven. But that is not the message and the melody of Christmas. The melody of Christmas is a whole lot better because the music matches the lyrics. Does that make sense? That is the message of Christmas. Religion says if you try hard enough to be good and you'll earn your way to heaven. But in reality, that is a horror story. I am never going to be good enough to get to heaven. Not on my own. Now let's look for a moment about a song that was written by the prophet Isaiah hundreds of years before Jesus was born. From Isaiah 9, 6-7. This is a prophet, prophetic song about Jesus. It says, For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, and Prince of Peace. Jesus does not just bring us peace, he is peace. And there's a big difference there. But I want to look a little bit closer at this phrase, Prince of Peace. Now, again, I'm going to go back to the, the Hebrew just for a second. Uh, the word prince, prince, is actually, it, that word better translates not as prince. So in fact, this is, this is one of like, the only times that it ever means prince. There's actually, it's a Hebrew word for prince, and it's not this. What the word actually means in Hebrew is commander or captain. In other words, Jesus is the commander or the captain of peace. There is no higher authority. I remember for years thinking, well, why is he just the prince of peace? Why can't he be the king? Why can't he be the king of, king of peace? I think the original translators just thought it sounded kind of cool in English, prince of peace. 
but it really is the commander of peace. There is no higher authority in the world that can bring peace to your life and to my life than Jesus Christ. He is the commander of peace. Now look at what Isaiah goes on to say about this, new, this ruler's new government. Verse 7. The dominion will be vast and its prosperity will never end. And again, sorry everyone to geek out about the original language here, but guess what the root word for prosperity is? It's shalom, peace. Remember in week one we said this. We said that shalom, peace, is not just the absence of conflict, but the presence of blessing. A lot of times we think of peace as just no conflict, but it's not just that. Shalom, peace, is, is, what is what these translators try to capture it here. It's prosperity. It's blessing. It's, it's an abundance of life. It's joy. It's all these things wrapped into one. And that is the kingdom of God. So according to, the, to, to Isaiah, the kingdom of the commander of peace will be full of abundant blessings. And according to the heavenly hosts, that word, remember again, I said it in, in, in the Greek, for peace is the still restful peace. And so in other words, we have blessings, and we have, and once we have joy and all these blessings, Jesus brings that, that peace that brings stillness where we are at rest. That is good news. Amen? Jesus is singing a beautiful lullaby of peace and good news over all of us. During Jesus' later years, he spoke often of peace. And in many ways, his words sound like a lullaby. I want to read from John 14, verse 18. He said, Jesus said this. He said, no, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you also will live. I am telling you these things now while I am still with you. But when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is, the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. I am leaving you with a gift. Here's the Christmas gift. Peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. See, what is that message that the world is trying to give us? The world is singing a whole different kind of lullaby. It's a lullaby of, that's fear-based. It's the wolf's going to come get you if you don't stop crying. That the, the giant's going to come get you if you don't start being good enough. But the, the, the peace that Jesus gives us is that when he took our sins for us on the cross, he's saying it's done. Those, those words, it is finished on the cross, are the most, some of the most powerful words we will ever hear. It's done. Stop striving. Rest in his peace. That is the Christmas lullaby. You know, I, I, the, the message that the world speaks to us also is that, and you hear this a lot, is that believe in yourself. And you hear this a lot of times in, on cartoons, like believe in yourself. And that's not always a good thing because like I know me. I don't want to believe in myself in a sense because I, I know that there are certain talents and abilities that I have and there's things that I can do, but it's all from God anyway. And so if I, but if I'm trying to trust in myself to never make another mistake, I'm in trouble. And I believe that many of us, though, because of this culture mindset, have become self-soothers. What is self-soothing? Soothing? Studies have shown that when a child who cries at night, who is never held or comforted by a loving adult, ends up developing neurological issues because they learn to self-soothe. The child quickly learns that if I cry and no one ever comes to get me, that I'll just take care of myself. But that's not healthy for a child. A parent should soothe the child on, on a somewhat healthy basis. I'm not saying, of course, that you should never let a child cry in their crib for a little bit. And that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying, though, is that there should be, though, a sense of, that when, when a baby cries, that, that, that at least on a regular, somewhat regular basis, that someone's going to come and care for them. In fact, the studies have shown that in orphanages where there's just too many children around the world, a lot of times the caretakers who love the children just don't have time to care for those, those orphans. And many orphans who grow up in, in those orphanages who are never held, like ever, they develop neurological issues when they're older. And it, and it becomes harder for them to receive love and to receive touch and compassion. And this is why Jesus said, 
He will never leave us as orphans. Self-soothing is not good for us. And so God has said, I will come. I will sing the lullaby over you. I will bring you peace because Christmas is a whole different message and lullaby. You see, when, when, when Jesus comes to us as orphans, when you cry, he holds you. And when you're afraid, he tells you his story. So be at peace this morning. You cannot save yourself. God came to us and rescued us, and now you can rest. Jesus is standing over you, and he's singing a lullaby. He's singing a lullaby over all of us. Let me just pray. Lord, God, I ask that right now, no matter where we are in our faith and our trust in you, help us to receive your message of peace. Help us to receive your lullaby. And that we don't have to strive. Jesus, you have communicated your message of peace and hope and joy to us. And God, if there's anyone here who has not received that message of hope and peace into their hearts, Lord, I pray that you would stir in their hearts, God. God, we're all in the same boat. We're all the same. But we all must make a choice. And so if that's you here this morning, my prayer is that you would just, that you would take it to God in prayer. Talk to him. God is not a God to, to, to be afraid of. He's going to kind of punish you. He has given us hope. He has offered us a future in him. Let me respond. Man, we have, we want, we're gonna, in a few minutes, we're going to sing a song of, of praise and thanks and that really declares, in a sense, the gospel message. Before we do, just turn your attention to the screen for a video. Let's all stand together, shall we, as we declare the goodness of the Lord. Children that are in here, I just want to congratulate you. You guys were so well behaved today. Thank you. Yeah, they deserve a round of applause. They were amazing. They were amazing.
and of praise. So today, Lord, we lift you up. We praise you. We worship you and we thank you for coming to us to give us peace, to give us rest, to give us blessings, many of which are scurrying around the room at the minute. And we thank you for that. And we praise you in the beautiful and matchless name of Jesus. And all the believers said amen.